Captain scientist and oceanographer, waits for his ship Calypso to arrive in Monaco on the eve of his most important expedition, the sea explorer, looks that await mystery of the sea. In the Indian Ocean, Cuso will sail against in Burma. Will sperm whale, not to kill him, but to learn about him. who will seek the knowledge that will help save magnificent creatures threatened by extinction. On unexplored islands, we will search for the unusual animals that thrive on the sea. We will trace the history of the oceans in fossil rocks dating back millions of years. From cages made of plexiglass, we will film life that is serene, savage, or beautiful. We will explore the graveyards of the sea for whatever treasures are hidden, knowledge or gold. Each time we dive, each time we enter the sea, we learn something new. It is the promise that lures us, and we have never been better equipped to see, to learn, to record. This voyage is the culmination of my life's work, to explore and unravel the mysteries of the sea. killing machine with finely balanced instincts of curiosity and caution he comes out of the remote past virtually intact a primitive creature that can be traced back in a direct line over 180 million years he is one of the most puzzling species of the sea to understand him he must be met on his own terms in his own environment this is the challenge that awaits Cousteau and the men of the Calypso The Oceanographic Institute is the scientific headquarters of Captain Jacques Cousteau. When you are diving and meet a shark, what do you do? There is no definite answer to that question. 
There are many kinds of sharks, and each kind behaves very differently according to influences we know little about. Several rows of razor sharp teeth provide them with a deadly weapon. This tooth, for example, belonged to a very large, dangerous shark of a species still living today. But much larger similar teeth are to be found in sedimentary layers. They are fossil teeth from huge sharks extinct since many million years ago. Divers in their nightmares may dream about such monsters looking probably like this model. In the harbor at Monaco, the Calypso is prepared for departure. Fitted with the most advanced oceanographic equipment yet devised, it will carry Captain Jacques Cousteau on his voyage of discovery. For the first time, a scientific expedition has been equipped not only to research, but to place on film for a vast audience the results of its explorations. It is February the 17th, the date of the first entry in the new logbook of Calypso. The men, the equipment are on board. Today, we receive from the Famille Princière de Monaco a final addition to our crew, our mascot, Zoom. The Odyssey begins as sea ventures have always begun, with a contagious sense of excitement and fanfare. But this is a modern Odyssey a composite of science and adventure, a special photographic journey through the landscape of man's last frontier on Earth, a five-year probe into inner space. From the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, around Africa, Calypso will go. Then across the Atlantic to South America, into the Pacific, back again to the Caribbean, finally following the Gulf Stream on her return to Europe. March 10th, Calypso is en route to a Red Sea island where we hope to find sharks. For all her 400 tons, the ship carries only 30 men. Each must be an expert in more than one field. Divers like Bernard Mestre and Roger Chopin double as engineers, photographers, and mechanics. Other divers are experienced marine biologists, archaeologists, navigators, and seamen. We have few rules and no uniforms. Only the red cap, the traditional hat for divers. <laughs> Each dive is discussed so that the camera director, Philippe Cousteau, and head diver, Canoe, can coordinate the plans. My divers are young because it takes great strength and endurance to sustain prolonged journeys beneath the sea. Cousteau has designed a revolutionary backpack for Calypso divers. In addition to air tanks for up to an hour and a half's underwater work, there is power for night diving headlamps and a sophisticated combination of radio sonar devices enabling communication between divers under sea, divers to launch, or to the Calypso. Shark specialist, Serge Foulon, carries the standard 85-pound aqualung invented by Cousteau. More than anything else, it has helped open the undersea world. They are ready to begin their search for the shark. Among them, the divers have spent thousands of hours underwater. 
but each time I send them down, I feel uneasy until they're back on deck. A new device gets the divers into the water, the chute. on the shoot is cameraman Philippe Cousteau. We have begun our search for the shark. We do not know where he will come from, nor what attracts him most. But we do know that wherever other fish have gathered, the shark will soon appear. The divers have come as friends with food. And once the fish are sure they mean no danger, Foulon and Ruiz are overrun by them. tip shark with a record of unprovoked attacks on human beings. Even for the experienced diver, there's danger. Attached to their tanks is a shark belly, a weapon to bump and butt the white tip away until they can reach safety. Foulon and Ruiz form a back-to-back -back defense. Without unnecessary movement to agitate the shark's interest, they start to the surface, knowing that away from the ocean floor, they are also vulnerable from beneath. shark, nothing is predictable, so it is a relief to have Foulon, Ruiz and Philippe back on deck. We know now the place is right. We can mount our major experiments on sharks in this area. Aboard the Calypso at Cousteau's invitation is one of the world's foremost authorities on sharks, Dr. Eugenie Clark an ichthyologist, founder of Florida's Cape Hayes Marine Laboratory. She has come to observe and to experiment with sharks in the open sea. Recently, we have met a white tip uh, albinarginatus. That was at least 13 feet long. I think it's rare. Yes. And you say so even the little ones are aggressive. Yes, yes. More than the big ones dashing from one point to the other with tremendous speed. Philippe had quite a specialty, to find himself with a shark under each arm. <laughs> like one. Now, people say, oh, it's a small shark, because the shark is about that big. 
a shark that big can take a mouthful bigger than any big dog. Even and and people are, are afraid of dogs that big. They can take uh, almost nothing. A shark the same size can take in a half a pound of meat. The 25th of March. Experiments begin. Most specialists agree that sharks are attracted by blood. But if there is no blood, what will attract them to an alien presence, a diver? Is it sight or smell? The mutilated diver is not a man at all, but an experimental dummy named Arthur. To learn why the shark attacks, we started with Arthur fully equipped and filled with rags. He looks like a diver, but he lacks one thing, scent. To find which is the stronger sense, sight or smell. Arthur is filled with fish the shark cannot see. Always the shark is cautious. The primitive computer of his mind totals all the factors that must be present before he acts. Drawn by smell, he stalks Arthur, testing for possible resistance. Only when he is sure that his victim cannot escape, that there is no danger for him, will he become aggressive. This pattern of instinct has maintained the survival of his species for hundreds of millions of years. April 6th. Today we begin one of our most significant assignments to trace the migration of sharks. Are they sedentary or do they travel from island to island or ocean to ocean across great distances? In location over a selected reef. The divers will be asked to mark a wide variety of sharks for later identification. Head diver Canaway makes the tag team assignments. Ruiz will do the tagging, guarded by Foulon. Philippe will photograph. It is vital that the tag be placed at a specific spot that will not injure the shark or impair its movement. The target area is at the base of the dorsal fin. Depending on the circumstances, the divers will use a long spear or a short dagger to mark the shark. Barbed hooks with a red tag attached will be placed in the hollow end. The detachable point must penetrate the shark's tough skin made of the same substance as his teeth. The red tags give date and location, and bear request that when found, they be returned to Cousteau's headquarters in Monaco. The divers will be working near the surface during tagging and therefore are most vulnerable. To provide them with a safe shelter in the open sea, we have designed special anti-shark cages.
The blue whaler is one of the most splendid but unpredictable of all sharks. He follows the whales to prey on the sick, the young, the defenseless. In the sea-diffused afternoon sunlight, a bullfight-like ritual has begun. A shark passes back and forth, while a man searches for the right moment to place his banderillo. It is a corrida, a bullfight, without cape or kill, but with the same mastery over self and fear. At night, the foredeck becomes a movie theater. The films shown were taken by the Calypso, rushed for processing, and then picked up at a designated port. A giant grouper, weighing upwards of 250 pounds, was photographed by Calypso divers exploring a shipwreck. The grouper was surrounded by hundreds of tiny pilot fish. A startling sight, for it had been long thought that pilot fish swim only with the sharks. Cousteau found that they also flocked to divers. Pilot fish were even found swimming for days in front of Calypso. The myth about vertically striped pilot fish originated in antiquity. It was believed that they led the shark to its prey and in return were protected by their powerful master. A good story, but not true. The pilot fish actually feeds on the scraps of the shark's meal and survive in his presence because they are too agile for him to catch or perhaps too insignificant for him to bother. July the 10th. The heat in the Red Sea has averaged 105 degrees during the day but water conditions remain excellent for filming. Today, we will fish for sharks, looking for evidence that our tagging operation has been effective. Cousteau has observed that tagged sharks are the bolder, more curious ones of the species, and therefore most likely to appear again. The boldness that brought the sharks close enough to be tagged will probably bring them in after bait. Splash and scent alert the creature. Ironically, the formidable eater does not need much food. He can live more than a month without eating. Without food, he will stop growing, but he will survive. Once the shark is hooked, he will not fight for long. The killer is fragile. His skeleton is made of cartilage. He has no bones. It is probable that the jarring fight at the end of a line has fatally dislodged his vital organs. Yet, the shark dies slowly. Mortally wounded, he will still swim for hours. The most important part of tagging 
will be the knowledge gained over a long period by the recovery of the tags. Number 014. Just a minute. Yes. Uh, three weeks ago. This was tagged three weeks ago. So that this shark is not swimming in the open ocean. He's living there around the reef. It's a yes. sedentary shark. I think it's very important to have proven it. It will take a great many tag recoveries to finally establish the migrating patterns of the sharks. It was on May 8th that a great moment of discovery occurred. We came upon a creature I had seen only once in 35 years at sea, the whale shark. And even this monster was marked with a calypso tag. He is the largest of the shark species, measuring up to 60 feet, weighing more than 60 tons. For all his size, the whale shark is the gentlest of all the sharks. The only food he will eat is microscopic plankton and small fish. at the surface, he returns to his deep realm. August 20th, a month of sandstorms has clouded the water and made filming difficult. They have passed now and we will return to shark filled waters. Dr. Eugenie Clark has originated unique experiments for testing shark ability to learn and make visual discriminations. On board the Calypso, she will recreate the experiments for Cousteau's men to try in the open sea. The key is a striped-faced target. Dr. Clark's target will help test all of the shark's sensory capabilities, sight, sound, and smell. <laughs> Off the Suwakin Islands, Dr. Clark, divers Foulon, Templier, and Dr. Francois will set up twin targets. One is vertical striped, the other horizontal. In some cases, the learning ability of a shark is believed to be roughly that of a domestic rat. If this is so, it should be possible to train them to come for food in answer to visual clues. Bait is attached to the horizontal striped target, while a vertical striped one is left bare of food. When the shark takes food, a 
pipe is wrapped to confirm the shark's contact with the correct target. The shark tends toward the vertical, either for reasons of eye structure or habit from seeing other striped fish. After cautiously veering toward the vertical, the shark finally takes the bait from the horizontal target. Again, the shark first examines the vertical target before seeking the food on the horizontal one. After a period of weeks, when the training is successful, the sharks will ask for food by hitting the bare horizontal target. September 12th, the squaloscope is ready. A giant cage topped by a plexiglass dome, it has been assembled by the engineers aboard the ship. It is an unconventional gadget to observe the effects of narcotics on the shark. An alien apparition. Squaloscope descends into a peaceful sea. Life will flow around it and through it. Only the shark will be held inside, where both man and camera can see him. Working as a team, Foulon and Canaway set their trap. A piece of fish on a long line is placed in front of the cage. Once the shark has grasped the bait, he will be pulled into the cage. As soon as he is inside, Foulon will close a plexiglass door, locking the shark in squaloscope. study a living shark at close range. He must be drugged. A new compound is tested, pumped in with a giant steel syringe. The excess drug escapes through his gills. They want to learn if the drug will be effective, how long it will last, and what are the after effects. It takes less than 30 seconds for the drug to tranquilize the shark. The shark that Canaway affectionately calls Gargantua is easily controlled. Putting bait out again agitates the other sharks and brings them into the cage with Gargantua. The excitement draws a host of sharks from surrounding waters. The divers cling close to the squaloscope as the fury of baited sharks increases. After 10 minutes, Gargantua returns to apparently normal behavior. The new compound works. September 13. Now we will concentrate on pressure wave experiments. A launch equipped with television cameras is lowered to provide instant information on a test. The TV camera is linked to a motion picture camera so that divers can observe as well as film the events. First, a live fish must be caught.
We think that the pressure waves generated by a fish in trouble will bring the shark. Because the shark's flanks are paved with nerve endings, his whole body is a large antenna for receiving infrasonic impulses from great distances. At the start, no shark had been seen in the area. The live fish trolled through the water, attracted the shark in less than two minutes. In taking the bait, the shark is bitten through a steel wire leader. September 18th. Many myths are gone. We are sure the shark sees well, possesses a refined sense of smell, and is extraordinarily well equipped to receive specific vibrations. Normally, however, he hesitates to bite a creature that appears capable of resisting him. Nevertheless, we have hundreds of reports of sharks injuring swimmers. Now we will concentrate on the problem of repelling the shark. With a bait fish, Canaway makes a shark repellent sandwich. For years, it has been believed the most effective repellent was copper acetate mixed with a powerful dye. Packets of shark chaser, like the one in Canaway's sandwich, were given to airmen who might be forced down in the sea. It was good for morale at best. September 26th, we will try the newest shark protection device. With Canaway riding shotgun on a small launch, Philippe Cousteau tests the latest U.S. Navy shark shield, the inflatable Johnson shark screen, a life ring with a large plastic bag attached, concealing a man's scent and camouflaging his body. Cousteau directs the operation, watches his son take the safety line, then splash the water to attract the shark. He knows the reputation of the raft, but also knows should the shark, for some reason, attack. Plastic is no protection against his powerful thrust and tearing teeth. He orders Philippe taken aboard. The shark has come too close. Divers standing by in case of emergency, Cousteau allows a broader test. Three men floating amidst sharks. Apparently, all the creature sees are dark, confusing objects with no limbs or feet to bite at, no familiar shapes, and no smell. The Johnson screen is the most effective shark protection yet devised. October 8th, we have tracked the shark through the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and the Indian Ocean. There is still one major experiment remaining. Informal conferences are held at dinner. It is one of the few times virtually all the crew is gathered in one place. On this night, the divers, Dr. Clark and Cousteau, discuss the problems of diving in darkness. To study their unpredictable behavior, it is necessary to observe the sharks at night. When we put our powerful 750 watt lamps on, 
tonight using strongly reinforced cages. Powerful lights mounted on them make night filming possible and may also serve as a lure to the sharks. Under the cover of darkness, do sharks feel more protected and are they less wary? At night, the shark's superior sense of smell and sensitivity to vibrations gives him an advantage over the diver. The sea at night is more fine, more mysterious or frightening. Two harrowing hours, invisibility limited to the pool of light around the cage. Now, it is as if they have come back from hell. Through the night and into dawn, the operation continues, drawing more and more sharks to the Calypso. From the TV monitor room of the Calypso, Cousteau supervises operations. Through the sonar telephone system, the captain maintains direct voice contact with the divers. The spearing of a fish increases the agitation of all the creatures and lures an unexpected predator, a grouper weighing upwards of 200 pounds. The incident ignites an explosion, the full-fledged frenzy of sharks in the sea.
Divers keep the sharks swarming near the cages with handheld bait. Again, the most aggressive of the sharks are those already tagged. The divers must drive them away to allow others to come close. The primary goal is to observe both underwater and on the monitors above the feeding frenzy. Is that one of the tagged sharks now? Uh, this one, yes, sure. You see the label uh, below the dorsal fin. Uh, it's not unusual. We have tagged almost 120 sharks uh, since February. And uh, I think that in this area about one out of three is already wearing a, a label on its now back. There's another one. Aren't they getting a bit the sharks are getting too aggressive. All is well. Listen to me closely. Yes, Commandant. We are finished. Come up quickly. Rear deck. Bring up the cages. Placed on film, will soon be subjected to study by specialists in Monaco and the United States. For what has been seen and photographed is unique. So we close the story of the shark. We have studied him and often felt endangered by him. Occasionally, he will appear in our nightmares. But most of us have come to admire him for his power and elegance. The shark is a splendid savage, one of the most magnificent creatures of the sea. For the men of Calypso, the voyage has just begun. Ahead lies further adventure and discovery in the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau.